need to know that's where we are in time, and the other is stuff we're going to be talking about. Um, I don't know who would like to, whoever would like to step up, grab the back microphone, and let's talk. Oh, my friend from Virginia, step up. Tell us what you got to say, Rob. Well, thank you, Representative Carter. I thank you and Representative Gomer for your leadership in putting forth a, a bill to make sure we address this issue of military pay for our men and women in uniform. And, you know, Mr. Speaker, we shouldn't even be here tonight. We should be having before us a spending decision that doesn't call into question whether or not we can pay our men and women in uniform. Now, that's absolutely reprehensible. You know, it's clear that this spending discussion needs to be focused, and it needs to be focused on making sure that we're getting our troops paid. Bottom line, period. You know, I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to travel to Afghanistan, and I had the privilege there to visit with a, a young man who's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And I had met his family earlier in the little town of Pocos, and I was there for a, a pancake breakfast one morning there at, at, a, at a middle school. And I had a chance to see his family there, and I talked to his wife, and I met his children, and they told me that their father was deployed downrange, and I asked where he was, and they gave me the information. I said, well, listen, I'm going to be going there soon. I want to make sure that I have a chance to visit him. So I was able to, to go downrange and visit this fine lieutenant colonel that's doing a great job for this nation. They are under very trying conditions there in Afghanistan. Had a chance to thank him for his service, and had a chance to also, when I got back, to call his wife and to thank her and her family for their sacrifice and for them staying back home here in anxiety as, as their father and husband served downrange. And folks, I cannot imagine being in a situation to look that lieutenant colonel in the eye and say, you know something, thank you for your service, thank you for your sacrifice, but we don't think, about enough, uh, we don't think enough about what you're doing to even have the backbone to stand and make sure that you get paid. You know, how do, how do we look at their family? That mother who's at home, those children whose father and husband are downrange being deployed, and to, and to look them in the eye and say, hey, listen, thanks for your, thanks for your sacrifice, but by the way, uh, we're not going to be able to make a decision up here to make sure that you get the paycheck that supports your family in the weeks to come. I mean, I cannot imagine how we are letting ourselves get to that point. Mr. Speaker, there is a, there's a lack of fortitude to make sure that we get this done and get it done now. Uh, just as Representative Carter said, the time is now. This needs to get done. We have a deadline of Friday. This Congress needs to act, get this done. And also, as he pointed out, we have a spending problem here. It is clear that spending is absolutely out of control. And Would just the gentleman you... yield for just a moment? Please, yes. We have, we have a... Uh, the, the gentlelady wishes to present something from the Rules Committee. For what, for what purpose does the gentlelady from North Carolina rise? Seek recognition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I send to the desk a privileged report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. Report to accompany House Resolution 206. Resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 1363, making appropriations for the Department of Defense for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2011, and for other purposes, and waiving a requirement of Clause 6A of Rule 13 with respect to consideration of certain resolutions reported from the Committee on Rules. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. The gentleman from Texas may proceed. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Whitman, I yield back to you. Thanks for the interruption. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. It's, uh, <laughs> again, an honor to have Ms. Fox here to give us that report from the Rules Committee. I want to go back and talk about what we have before us. As Mr. Carter said, clearly there is a spending issue that we need to address. We're on an unsustainable path. This has to be done. This decision has to be done on time. And, you know, the American people expect leadership out of this Congress. They expect leadership out of both sides. Uh, as the Speaker said, we can't continue to negotiate with ourselves. We have to have folks on the other side of the aisle that are willing and able to say, yes, we're going to get these things done. There's at least a counterproposal instead of saying no, no, no. There has to be more to this than no. You know, our goal is to cut spending and reduce the size of government. It's not to shut it down. I know you're going to, you hear out there people say, oh, you know, they want to shut it down. They want to shut it down. That's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to shut it down. We want to make sure that our military get paid. 
That's, that's the bottom line. And we have to get this done as soon as possible. And, you know, my question is, is Congress in Washington, D.C. so out of touch that we don't get it? that we don't get what the American people have sent us here to do, what they want us to accomplish. You know, do they, do they expect from us that we're going to forego a budget and not ensure that our military families get paid? You know, I think that's not the case. They want to make sure we act, and I want to make sure we act, and make sure that we get things done. And I think we ought to bypass the 72-hour review rule and get this done out of respect for our men and women in uniform. And Again, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Mr. Carter and Mr. Gomert, for their leadership in bringing this bill forward to ensure that our military get their pay. And I'm a proud co-sponsor of that act because I think it's the responsible way to go about getting things done. And I was also eager to join 80 of my colleagues in signing a letter to Senate Majority Leader, Leader Harry Reid to let him know that this needs to get done. We need to pay our men and women in uniform. You know, in my district, in what we call America's First District, we have a proud tradition of military there with seven military installations and a number of people there that serve this country and are now retired or in active duty. Uh, we have a great military presence there. And, and I got a call the other day from a mother in Stafford County, and she said this. She said, my husband is an active duty military officer, and if I understand the news correctly, if this budget isn't passed by April 8, 2011, the military will be expected to work it will not be paid until the budget has been passed. My family will struggle, and I'm concerned about how I'm going to pay my mortgage and feed my family. If the military is asked to work without pay, you will be causing severe stress in our families. And as a spouse who has endured my husband's de deployment in Iraq four times, I know the thought of not getting paid would be making me sick. I also know that I would not be able to talk to my husband about this concern because I wouldn't want him to worry. Please work hard and pass the budget. I'm counting on you. Folks, there's so many people out there that are counting on us, counting on Congress to stand up and do what is needed to be done, to make sure that our military families get paid, to make sure that we adopt a budget, to make sure that we get this country on the right track to reduce spending. The time has come for us to get that done. You know, our military members out there do a fantastic job for this country. It is unconscionable to even think about them worrying about not getting paid or for folks downrange to be thinking about what's happening here in Washington rather than being able to focus on their mission downrange. Folks, we need to get this done. Our military families serve this nation with honor, with distinction, and without question. And they are there performing flawlessly and they don't have to, I think, be expected to have that uncertainty about what's going to happen here in the future. So I want to make sure that this bill gets done and that we take away any worry from our military families or folks serving downrange. Our military families need to be worrying about the everyday uh, necessities of life and not have to worry about getting paid uh, and to make sure they can meet those necessities. And our men and women downrange need to be focusing on the mission that they have at hand. Uh, just as uh, Mr. Carter said, our military and their families have been to war now for almost 10 years, some of them on their fifth, sixth, and seventh deployments. You know, we need to keep in mind the sacrifice that those families make and know the great job that they're doing, the hard work that they put forward. It's time for us to show the same resolve here and get this budget done and make sure that we, without question, assure that our military families are paid, that our men and women that serve downrange get the respect that they deserve from this body here in Congress. So, Mr. Carter, I thank you for your leadership. Mr. Gomer, I thank him for his leadership in making sure that this is first and foremost in our minds about ensuring that our military gets paid. And with that, Mr. Carter, I yield, yield back. And I thank you very much for those comments. I want to point out that I have here the Ensuring Pay for Our Military Act 2011. Uh, Mr. Gomert is the co-sponsor of this, along with uh, Jack Kingston. Uh, I, was, I was worried about Louie. He was here a minute ago. He left. Uh, I'm going to recognize Christy Nome for, to discuss with me. I'll yield whatever time she needs. And then we'll get Mr. Gomert for a minute and let it hear what he has to say. I appreciate that. Thank you, the gentleman, for yielding to me. You know, I'm one of the new members of Congress uh, that, that has first come here tonight. This is the first opportunity I've had to give a special order. And I cannot think of a better reason 
to be here tonight than to make sure that our military men and women have the opportunity to receive pay for their hard work and for their service to our country. You know, I think it's extremely important that we focus on all of the important things that this Congress is doing and the important things that this Republican conference in the House is doing because we recognize that from the very beginning we took every action possible to ensure that our military could get paid. We started with our first bill that addressed the spending problems that this country has. H.R. 1. We brought it to the House floor. We changed the way that this House does business by having an open process on the House floor. Hundreds of amendments were offered, and that bill ensured that paying our military was a priority from us. It got the job done. It did the work that the previous Congress did not do. The previous Congress did not choose to make that a priority. They did not choose to wrap up the business of fiscal year 2011. They left that for us to do, and then they left us in a big hole as far as the debt that this country is accumulating. We came in as the adults at the table. When our president talks about having adult conversations, addressing the spending in this country, and addressing the budget resolution that we need to come to, the only ones who have been doing that from the very beginning have been the Republicans in the House. We came with H.R. 1 with real spending cuts that would put us on a much better path that funded our military because we wanted to take care of them. We recognized that their families were at home while their spouses and family members were at war and they were trying to make ends meet while that was going on. I will tell you that I feel that the Democrats are holding our troops hostage, that they truly are, because they choose to do that so they can spend more money. They choose to hold them hostage and their pay hostage because they want to help this country accumulate more debt. And it's unacceptable. You know, we voted to fully fund their pay, to fund our troops through fiscal year 2011, through H.R. 1, and we're still dedicated to that and still pursuing that because it's a very high priority for us. I'll tell you that the Department of Defense is allowed to continue operations without appropriations because of its authority to protect the national security. But I will also tell you that military personnel are scheduled to receive their paychecks on April 15th. Now, if this government truly does shut down, if it truly does shut down tomorrow night, uh, they will only receive one week's pay instead of the two that they are owed. And that is not right. When you look at people who are at war overseas, standing on that wall so we can sleep safely in our beds at night, and we're telling them we're not going to pay them for doing that, then that is truly a travesty, and a travesty that we should not allow to happen. And if this shutdown were to continue, and to continue on and on, and they would not be paid, we cannot do that to their families. You know, people, people talk about the debt that this country accumulates, and they recognize the fact that it is a big uh, deficit, that it continues to accumulate. I, the way that I talk about it back home in South Dakota is that months ago, when I was making the analogy and talking about the fact that our country borrows 40 cents out of every dollar that it spends, well, just in the few short months since I was talking about that back in October and November, now it's that we borrow 42 cents out of every dollar. You know, I used to tell my son, you owe $42,000. You're responsible for that. That's the amount of our federal debt that you're responsible for. Well, just in a few short months now, he's responsible for almost $46,000. You know, that boy is eight years old. That boy is eight years old, and he owes that kind of money because of the irresponsibility of this government and because of the irresponsibility of the previous Congress and the Congresses before that that did not get this spending under control. And that's what we're trying to address today. And that's why we're making sure we're addressing the spending cuts, we're being much more responsible in what we're proposing, and we're also making it a priority to make sure that our military gets funded. You know, I think that it is absolutely um, discouraging to see that we're even having to pursue uh, the priority of funding our military during these times and that it is being held hostage literally through these discussions that have gone on. It doesn't seem reasonable or fair to ask our military men and women to have to worry about the types of situations that they would be put in. Many of them live paycheck to paycheck, just like a lot of families are during this recession in America right now. You know, they're having a tough time. How do they make their car payment? How do they make their housing payment? When they're out there standing and serving our country, we're telling their families that we're putting their ability to even pay their bills in jeopardy. And then you look at the situation that we're accumulating more and more debt in this country that is only going to lead to higher inflation. It's only going to devalue the dollar. I was talking to someone last week about what that really means. When you talk to people on the street about what does it mean when the dollar is devalued? Well, what that means is that Maybe that loaf of bread that that military wife needs to go buy next week when she only has half of a paycheck, well, someday 
instead of costing her $2, will cost her $4. Maybe it'll cost her $6. And so we're telling her, not only are we putting you in the situation where you're going to be faced with high inflation, that you're going to be faced with a dollar that's not worth as much as it used to be because people in Washington, D.C. couldn't have some discipline in their spending, spending habits, couldn't make the tough decisions. Well, on top of all of that, then we're going to keep your spouse's pay. On top of that, we're not going to pay him, even though he's risking our life for our country. And it absolutely is wrong, and it absolutely needs to stop. Mortgages don't stop. Bills don't stop. Car payments don't stop. How do we expect these men and women to continue paying for their everyday living expenses when they have no paycheck? You know, in South Dakota, we have an Air Force base, Ellsworth Air Force Base. We have 1,000 civilians that work there and over 3,000 military personnel. Those people are extremely special to me. Uh, not all of them grew up in South Dakota, but they're all affects these individuals, but it also is going to impact that local economy where they're trying to raise their children and raise their families. You know, two Ellsworth Air Force Base B-1 bombers were recently involved in the Libyan military strikes. Missions like Odyssey Dawn are likely to continue whether the government shuts down or not. These missions are risky, they're costly, they're vital for our national security. Doesn't it seem unreasonable that the Democrats here in Washington, D.C., would put those servicemen and women in harm's way to protect our freedoms and then not compensate them for the work that they have done, simply because they want to spend more money and they want to put this country further into debt. There are reasons, these are all the reasons, why I have fought on every CR to make sure our military men and women get paid, why we're continuing to do that, and I thank you for bringing this bill. It is critical, and for no other reason, I have had family members that have served, I have had friends that have served, friends that are, have been overseas and have stood on that line so that we could continue to live the kind of freedoms and have the kind of liberty in this country that we have today. Uh, but even if I didn't, I'm an American, and I recognize the importance of having them there to protect us and to protect our future. And I am grateful every single day for the sacrifice and the service that they offer to us. It is completely inappropriate for us to play politics with military pay. We owe these men and women at least some financial stability in return for all of their service that they provide to us, to our children, and to our country. So thank you for the time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I'll, I want to say I agree with everything you have to say. And as you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, our soldiers are not asking for somebody to excuse their mortgage. They're not asking somebody to come bail them out. They're just asking to be paid for the dangerous blood, sweat, and tears work that they're doing right as we speak today, right now. Somebody's being fired on somewhere in the world in an American uniform. It's a frightening thing to think about, but it's true. And they just want to have the paycheck they earn. And their, their families back home want to be able to stay current on their bills. And they're not asking for these gr grandiose bailouts that this uh, body has become famous for. They're just saying, give me my paycheck. Now, this is not hard stuff. Uh, I want to recognize Congressman, ba my, my, my good friend, Congressman Goldberg. He... Uh, is the, is the author of this bill. I think we've got it done well. Here's soldiers. Might even be some of mine, <laughs> Fort Hood. And uh, you started the ball rolling. I, we've been talking about this for a long time, that we couldn't get down here without, if we're getting close to this deadline, we've got to get the soldiers paid. I want to recognize Louis Gomert, who, who introduced this, along with Jack Kingston. I joined with them on this. Now our leadership is, a, is, is offering an alternative submission which would fund the entire DOD, which is an even better idea That's right. because of all the contract authority and all the things that, is go, uh, that go on that get hurt by not having an appropriations finished up with. And we're hopeful, although we're hearing signals, that it's going to be dead on arrival and they're not going to tell us what they want us to do. So. I'll submit this to you, and then I'll let you comment, Louie. Yeah. And that is, I would submit, if anybody's shutting down the government, it's the Democrats in the Senate, not the Republicans in the House. I yield to Mr. Gohmert. What do you...
And the time it, you wish to consume. Thank you, Judge Carter. And um, your comments also point to another aspect, not only your caring about America, caring about those that are fighting for us and your desire to fight for those here in Washington who are fighting for us, but it also shows a great deal about your humility because you and I both know you've been working on this issue just every bit as long and hard as I have, and yet you're, you're, you're giving Jack and I great credit, and I appreciate that. But the truth is you've done every bit as much work, perhaps more, than Jack and I have and, and the co-sponsors we have here. Um, but, you know, things here in Washington obviously don't get done in a vacuum, and it means so much when you have people like Christy, Rob, Nan, folks that are out here, all the other, we got over 102, over 100, I'm not sure how many over 100 now, co-sponsors on the bill. These are people that want to make sure that the military is not used as pawns in this game. And, you know, a lot of us haven't been thrilled about short-term CRs, but it does point one thing. The leadership of the Republicans in the House are committed and have been, even at the price of being criticized by people like me for doing short-term CRs, they are so committed to trying to do everything they can, and especially Speaker Boehner. He has really gone as far as humanly possible to do all that he could to avoid a shutdown, making it clear he doesn't want that. Some folks have been critical that he, he needed to stand up and be ready to do so. He has made it clear he doesn't want one. He doesn't believe it's good for America. And so uh, I, I know my friend uh, from uh, Round Rock, Texas, uh, sitting in Georgetown as a judge for so many years, uh, often looks at things like I do as an, another former district judge. You look at evidence to bear things out. Who's at fault? The American people are going to be looking around. Who's at fault? Well, you look at what's happened, and the evidence is quite clear. You have a group here, majority in the House, that has done absolutely everything possible to try to placate the Senate. We passed lots of bills trying to get the funding done, and why was that? Well, the evidence is clear. The Democratic majority last year refused to do what was required and pass a budget, no budget passed, no appropriation to fund things. Why? You can only speculate about that. It was an election year. Perhaps there was concern that if people really saw the total amount that they were going to be appropriating in all these areas, that it might have even been worse in the election in November. The people saw through, and the majority switched here in the House. And so here we are with these bills that have been filed pushing another bill this week here in the House. And in response, there has been nothing passed in the Senate. And people that know the rules know that the senators, any one of them, and of course they would have to be a Democrat that would have any chance of getting something passed because the Democrats under Harry Reid are in the majority. So a Democrat, any Democrat down there, could take the bill that... The bills we've done, the CRs that we've done, they could take those and do as they did in Obamacare. You know, that was, boy, here again, it's the military. The Obamacare bill was a bill to assist with a tax credit first-time homebuyers who were veterans. And what did the Senate do with that bill? They took the bill, since it had to originate in the House under the Constitution, they took it, and in their bill, they said they're taking the first-time homebuyer bill for veterans, stripping out every word, and substituting, therefore, about 2,700 pages of their Obamacare bill. Well, now, if they don't agree with what we've done, they could have taken our, any one of these CRs that we passed and said, we don't like it, We're not, it's dead on arrival. They could have taken those, stripped out every word, just like they did for the veterans, took out every word that helped the veterans, and substituted, therefore, their disastrous bill in Obamacare. They could have done that with their own CR, what they were going to fund, what they wanted to see happen. Not one 
person down there in the majority of the Senate has taken the leadership to do that. Some have said, well, why isn't the White House involved in what's going on in the Senate? Why aren't they showing some leadership down there? I heard someone say, well, that's the White House. It's a separate branch. The vice president of the country is and has been the president of the Senate. He has not only a vested interest, he is the presiding officer of the Senate. We have heard over and over from this president that Joe Biden is going to make sure things are done right. And yet, what did he do when the going got tough? Maybe he's tough because he got going to Russia. <laughs> yeah, and he disappeared. And when the going got tough for the president, he went to Brazil and played golf. And, and then issued an order from down in South America sending troops into battle. And we had a former president, Bush, who quit playing golf. He said it just didn't feel right to know our troops were in harm's way and I'd be out on some golf course. This president not only doesn't have a problem playing golf with people in harm's way, he takes time out of his golf round to send more people into Libya into harm's way. And to be assured today that, hey, we're, we really are going to get around to turning everything over to NATO and it won't be us, my friends, 65% of NATO is American military. It's not a lot of comfort to me. But the least we could do is to make sure that our military, and that includes reserves, and so that the, the military knows, it includes all pay, all allowances. You're not going to miss anything if the Senate will just do right by them. We have a standalone bill that could be passed in the next day or two, and uh, it's, it's House Bill 1297. 1297. It could be done, but as my friend from Round Rock has pointed out, our leadership, Speaker Boehner, has brought a CR for one week. He didn't want to do that. We know he didn't. But he was concerned about the military. And it funds all aspects of the military through the end of the year. And then we have this fallback bill that if the Senate is doing as they're indicating, eh, it's dead on arrival. We're not even going to pick it up and put our ideas and pass it through the Senate. They obviously, the evidence is clear, Judge, seems to me the evidence is all in and it's very clear. They want a shutdown. They think they win politically by forcing a shutdown and then blaming Republicans in the House. It's not only not the Republicans in the House fault, it's also clearly them playing games with our military, with the vital function of this country, and it isn't right. And I well, thank you for you. yielding, and I, I do thank so much. I know we've got uh, several of our critical key sponsors here on the House floor, and I am so grateful the, for the leadership. I mean, we're talking freshmen, we're talking people that haven't been here all that long, and yet they have grabbed this issue and have shown such leadership. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, Judge. We claim my time. Let me point out, as Mr. Gomer says, uh, those of us who sat in the co courtroom for years, in my case, almost 21 years, you, get, you want to look at the evidence to see what the evidence shows. And just very quickly, the evidence shows first, how do we get to a shutdown for failing to fund the government? Well, you start with last year when the Democrats were in charge of the House and Senate and the presidency, they passed no budget and not one single appropriations bill, although I'm on the appropriations committee. They certainly could have. They just chose not to. They chose not to. They chose the date that they would have a CR go into the next, next uh, term of Congress when they had already lost and knew how many of these wonderful people were going to be here replacing them the next time they showed up in this house. So they put this thing all the way to March, which they knew was going to put us under a tremendous amount of pressure to, to, get, to get something to do to fund the government. And we made diligent attempt to fund the government, and it didn't even last long enough for Harry Reid to say dead on arrival when it got to the Senate. So let's see. They didn't do their job. They didn't do their budget. They set up the CR deadline. We met the CR deadline with a, with a, with a 
way to fund the government for the rest of the year for all departments. They rejected it out of hand without even coming back with any alternative of, of any, any sub substance. They offered a $6 billion cut and spending as usual under Obama budget. And then now we've given two extensions to try to talk, and each time, dead silence. No comment. If there's a comment, it's to the press, and it's, it's, but to us, they're treating us like a stepchild. And then they're wanting to shut down the government when we say, at least let's protect our soldiers. Let's just take care of our troops. Before we've even got it over there tomorrow, Harry Reid and the president have both made a statement tonight. Dead on arrival, Harry Reid says, the president says, I'll veto it. He would veto the fund. That's what he supposedly said in Georgia. Now, I may be out of school. I didn't hear it. But I was told he did. That he said, I won't accept what Mr. Boehner is going to send to us. I will reject it. That's the bill that funds our troops. I think we've got other great people. Well, Judge, Scott, could, would you like to? Well, Judge, would you yield yes, for a question? For, yes. Um, since we know it would do no good for a Republican in the Senate to take a CR and and bring it to the floor of the Senate or, or file it, but we also know that any Democrat in the majority down there could do that and at least try to get over some Democrats. Uh, Judge, what does it tell you that not a single person in the majority has bothered to usher forth and file a CR of any kind to respond uh, or to take ours, modify it? What does it tell you about it what It tells that me means? that they're marching to route, route step to the commands of, of the majority leader, Harry Reid. And unfortunately, we didn't get elected to march route step in that fashion, we got elected, and senators included, to make decisions that are good for the American people. Uh, Scott, I, I, my, my friend from Virginia, I, I, I recognize you for the amount of time you need to consume. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the gentleman uh, yielding Judge Carter for your leadership in this uh, topic, and also for Representatives Gomert and Kingston for, for their leadership in this. And I, I'll tell Reclaiming you. just a moment. We have nine minutes. Nine minutes. Get, and I certainly I'll want to be uh, respectful of that, my York colleague. I, I will say this as the, uh, the son of an Iwo Jima veteran and as the proud father of a third generation Marine, it is uh, deeply troubling to me that we're even having to discuss how and, and if our men and women in uniform are going to be compensated. Um, a failure of leadership, Mr. Speaker, has left us in this precarious position, and uh, it is deeply troubling to me that we're having to address it tonight, the confusion that's out there. Just today, the White House said that military personnel would not be paid. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is failed leadership. How could it possibly be that the message from our Commander-in-Chief is that uh, it's very likely, if, we go, if this uh, shutdown occurs, that our men and women in uniform would not be compensated. This week, a senior Department of Defense official said that our troops would be paid for a week, uh, but not for two weeks. Just yesterday, the Pentagon spokesman said that the, the department had not issued any direction to the services about implementing a shutdown, and he really skirted the question of how a shutdown would affect the pay of our service members. Mr. Speaker, this lack of clarity is not only unnecessary, it's unconscionable. You know, brave men and women, uh, Americans are uh, around the globe, and they're putting their lives at risk, fighting for our freedom and our way of life. I just got back from a trip in Afghanistan, to Afghanistan, and uh, it's just unbelievable to think that uh, a young corporal in Helmand province would have to uh, speak or somehow communicate to his wife about whether he is going to get paid or not. You know, our men and women in uniform, they deserve our unwavering support from this Congress. And if uh, our military is not paid, Mr. Speaker, I believe that members of Congress and the Commander-in-Chief should not be paid, not one nickel. You know, my office gets calls every day from, uh, from spouses of our military. They're, they're concerned, and, and understandably so. And uh, let's, let's be clear on this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the genesis of this crisis that we're in is because uh, the, the Democratic leadership last year 
had, uh, had the presidency, had the Senate, had the House, and failed to pass a budget. Not only was this a failure in leadership, I truly believe it's nothing less than an abdication of the responsibility that was entrusted to them by the American people. So here we are uh, debating last year's uh, budget. And as a result, we have this climate of uncertainty. And as an entrepreneur, I know that it's holding back job creation. As a result, we're operating, operating under a continuing resolution, which each and every service chief has said it's hurting the readiness of our military. I truly believe that we're a nation at serious and increasing risk because of our failure to manage our finances properly. Indeed, that's, that's why I ran for this office. And uh, I'm proud to be a Republican tonight because we have proposed a path towards uh, fiscal stability that would keep the government open. As has been pointed out, rightfully so, the Senate has failed to move on that proposal, pre preferring apparently uh, to allow the government to close and not pay our men and women in uniform. That is not acceptable. We must, we must achieve stability and funding. I stand ready to work with any member on the opposite side of the aisle here, and I know my colleagues do as well. This is so important. We must do what is right. The Senate must act. I truly believe that the House has met its responsibility, starting with H.R. 1. We've worked every day every day to resolve this. We must pass the Defense Appropriations Bill for the sake of our troops and our national security. And I encourage every American to let their senators and our president know that they want our troops paid on time. I really thank the gentleman for this time. I appreciate it. And I yield back. Reclaiming my time, I'll now yield the amount of time left, if it's necessary, to uh, the wonderful gentlelady from New York, Nan Hayworth. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership and for your commitment and your dedication. I have the privilege of serving the 19th Congressional District in New York, and the U.S. Military Academy at West Point is in our district. Wow. And we have sent, as we all know, uh, thousands of young men and women to join and to sustain the long gray line. And their talents and their commitment are made to our nation in order to defend us from threats from without. We owe them that same dedication and commitment and sacrifice and discipline here in the Congress, in the House, and in the Senate. And our President owes it to them and to the children of America whose future is at risk from within. We were elected in that great wave in November 2010 because the American people told us that we could no longer afford to continue on a path of enormous deficits and mounting debt. It is difficult to do what we are called on to do. And that presumably is why the Senate has so resisted the lead that we have offered them with the passage of a continuing resolution to compensate for a budget that was never passed for this fiscal year by the 111th Congress. It is difficult to say no to certain types of spending that have become the usual mode of behavior by the federal government. But that is what we are called on to do. And what we do pales in comparison with what the men and women who put themselves in harm's way around the world must do every day. What they sacrifice must be emulated by us in this small way. We must join together in the House and we must be joined by the Senate to pass this bill that will fund our troops through the end of fiscal year 2011 and will allow us the time that we need to bring everyone together to bring the Senate and the President on board so that they too will have that discipline that they need so that we can do what's right for America's future and so that we can get on to thinking as we must about the budget 
for 2012 and beyond. And I thank you, Judge Carter, for your leadership in assuring that our troops are properly cared for and for your leadership in this enormous and crucial fight for our nation's future. Thank, thank you. you. Reclaiming my time, I'm going to read, I don't know how much time is left, but our good friend from Tennessee, Congresswoman Black, is here, and I'm going to give her whatever time is left. Thank you not so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Speaker. I stand here tonight as a daughter, a wife, and a mother of veterans, and I'm an ardent supporter of our nation's military. These brave men and women can never be thanked enough for their service to our country, and this Congress must do everything that we can to stand up for those who defend America. Um, that is why I urge my colleagues to protect the military paychecks and to ensure that if the government shutdown were to occur, that the members of our armed forces and their families will receive their salaries on time. You know, this is not an issue that we can play politics with. And my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who seek to use these paychecks as our military, as a part of their plan to force a government shutdown, should absolutely be ashamed of themselves. Military families have already sacrificed so much for this country. Back in Tennessee, there are families who are worried right now about whether their loved ones are safe overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places, even around the country. And they're praying for their safe return home. Those military families should not, under any circumstances, have to worry about when and where the next paycheck is coming from. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you, and I apologize for the short time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Minority Leader. Um, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, we intend tonight to uh, talk about the deficit, solutions to the deficit, where it came from, and uh, what can be done about it in the context of creating jobs here in America. But before we get into that, we just heard a whole hour of uh, talk that really is based upon a fallacious foundation. That is, it's just not correct. Last year, in 2010, it was the Republican senators that blocked every attempt to pass legislation by threatening a veto and denying the 60 votes that were necessary. So when it came time to do a budget, it was impossible to put a budget through the Senate because of the Republican blockade in the, uh, uh, in the use of the filibuster. And similarly, when it came time to fund the government, that is to appropriate the money, the same thing happened. It was impossible to get the 60 votes out of the Senate because of the Republican blockade. So everything we've heard over this last hour about the uh, process that we're now underway, the continuing resolutions, uh, began with the blockade in the Senate by the Republicans as they continually threatened a filibuster. That's why we are where we are today. Now, with regard to the funding of the military, let's understand that the Democrats have always consistently voted to fund the military when it was a straight up and down vote. However, in the CR, first CR, that did have funding for the military, it also had extraordinary cuts that would create, would destroy, 700,000 jobs in the last six months of this fiscal year. March, April, May, June, July, August, September, and October. 700,000 jobs lost. The Democrats said, no way. No way are we going to throw 700,000 employed Americans out of, the, out of work, and we rejected that. Put a clean 
CR for the funding of the military on, and you'll have a 100% vote. But when you cobble together the kinds of foolish cuts, unwarranted cuts, 700,000 lost jobs, and then attach to it the military and expect support, you won't get it. The Democrats want this government funded. And we fought for more than a year and a half to get the government funded. We were blocked along the way. And now, as the Republicans put out these pieces of legislation, the continuing resolutions, and attach to it totally unacceptable language and unacceptable cuts to the American people, not to the Democrats, but to the American people, then we find this gridlock. What we want to do really is talk about jobs. Joining me tonight are two wonderful legislators, one from the, uh, well, let's see, imported from Detroit, and another one from the uh, manufacturing capital of the world. But I want to start with uh, an understanding of why we are where we are, and I know my colleagues will help me on this. First of all, the Democrats have been about creating jobs, from the stimulus to today. The GOP majority has been in power for 14 weeks. Zero, no, nada, nothing to create jobs. Not one jobs bill. In fact, the only bill that they have put on that has anything to do with jobs is one that destroys 700,000 jobs. So keep this in mind, American public. 14 weeks of GOP leadership in the House and not one piece of legislation that would create a job putting Americans to work this year and next year. That's the fact. Now, another fact. Where did the deficit come from? Where did the deficit come from? In order to understand where we are, we need to know where we've been. Here's what the deficit's all about. Beginning with Ronald Reagan, the budget was not balanced. Ronald Reagan, at the end of his term, left for the American public a $1.4 trillion deficit in the, year, in the years ahead. So at the end of each president's, or at the end of each year, and therefore at the end of a president's term, the Congressional Budget Office makes an estimate of what is going to happen over the next five to ten years. And at the end of Ronald Reagan's term, they said there would be a $1.4 trillion deficit going forward. George Walker Bush followed uh, Reagan, and at the end of his administration, the estimate by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office was that there would be a $3.3 trillion deficit going forward. That's the numbers provided by the Congressional Budget Office nonpartisan group. Bill Clinton came to office, established the pay for program, established the balanced budget uh, program, and at the end of his administration, it was projected going forward that there would be a $5.6 trillion surplus wiping out the American debt. That's what happened during the Clinton administration. So that in the years beyond the Clinton administration, had the same policies gone forward, the American debt would have been wiped out. However, however, another gentleman was elected, George W. Bush. And in his first year in office, the Bush tax cuts went into effect. The Afghanistan war started. And the deficit began to grow once again. So that in his second year, the second Bush tax cuts were added. And the Iraq war was started. Never before in American's history has a war been underway that was not paid for with tax increases. Instead, the Republicans and George W. Bush decided that they would start not one war, but two wars, 
and pay for it with borrowed money. The fourth piece was the unpaid for Medicare drug benefit, which didn't even require that the federal government force the insurance companies to compete for drugs. The result was at the end, oh, did I forget the Great Recession? I did. You add the Great Recession to it so that at the end of the George W. Bush administration, the projection from the Congressional Budget Office was that the deficit would grow by an additional $11.5 trillion. The George W. Bush Republican period created the Great Recession, two wars unpaid for, a major increase in the Medicare program, and the result, the Great Recession and the Great Deficit. This is what Obama faced the day he came into office. The greatest recession since the Great Depression and an $11.5 trillion deficit going forward. Those are the facts. That's where we started this. Now, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about this problem? The President has put forth a budget that would, in, five, in eight years, significantly reduce the deficit so that it wouldn't grow and allow us to pay the interest. Not removing it, not paying it all off, neither do the Republican proposals, but it would put us in a position where, that would not, where it would not grow. It takes time to solve the huge deficit problem that the George W. Bush, the Ronald Reagan, and the Bush Sr. put us into. And we can do it. But we cannot do it unless we grow this economy. And it's about growing the economy and creating jobs that we would now like to talk about. So I'm going to turn now to my colleague from Ohio, Betty Sutton, who has been working on the issue of putting Americans to work for a long, long time, and share with us where you are now with this proposal that you're putting forward. Well, I thank the gentleman. I thank you for your leadership. Uh, you know, you gave us a, a little bit of background that I think is really, really important when we talk about where this deficit came from and how it came to be. Um, I just add a couple of, of other points that uh, I think are significant. At the end of last year, we will remember that uh, the same people who are now uh, you know, cutting uh, indiscriminately, um, cuts aimed at, uh, at seniors, cuts aimed at uh, middle class Americans, uh, cuts aimed at Head Start and, uh, you know, low income housing, heating assistance and uh, community development block grants that add to economic activities in our communities. Those same folks, some of them were over there fighting to make sure that we had super tax cuts for billionaires that were also going to add exponentially to the deficit. Then they turn around and say, hey, we've got this horrible deficit. And so now everyone has to sacrifice, but whenever the American people hear the words, everyone needs to sacrifice, um, chances are if you're in the 95% of the population that controls um, uh, very little of the wealth in this country, they mean you. Uh, they don't mean that top 5% that controls most of the wealth in this country. They um, are all about protecting what they have and grabbing more power and uh, and so it's very interesting when we talk about where the policies coming out of the Republican House majority um, are these days because all of the the cuts seem to be targeted at uh, at the people uh, back in the district where I live hard-working salt-of-the-earth constituents who I am so honored honored to serve. And your point is well taken and very sad that the one bill that they put out there, I mean, hey, you don't have to take our word for it, the bill that they put out there uh, puts 700,000 jobs more than at risk. It's been determined by their, their own uh, Republican analysts uh, that it would be, it would be cost, uh, cost us 700,000 jobs. And frankly, our economic recovery, which is so fragile, is under threat. 
Uh, it, it really, you know, if you look at a group of 300 economists, including two Nobel laureates, wrote a letter warning that the short-sighted budget cuts uh, to, quote, human capital, our infrastructure, and the next generation of scientific and technological advances would threaten future economic competitiveness as well as the current recovery. So the path that the Republicans are on, and, you know, it's funny because we just saw the, the new budget proposal unveiled, and they called it a path to prosperity. I think that, that the better name is the path to poverty, uh, but at any rate, the, the, the path that they are on is not a good one. We know that the answer, the answer to what ails our economy is we need to put the American people back to work. We need to have jobs that will create uh, opportunities for the people that we're so honored to represent, that will keep our communities running, will have the revenue that we need to pay for those services, those firefighters, those teachers, those police officers, those nurses, those public servants uh, that make our world turn. Uh, and so everyone at all levels of government, regardless of party, should be focused on priority one, getting Americans back to work. And that's where we come in with what we need to be focused on, and that is how do we make it in America? Manufacturing matters. Uh, and, and so we are working in this House, as you know, Congressman Garamendi, to make sure that we put forth an agenda on the Democratic side of the aisle, and we hope that our Republican colleagues will, will, will stop being deflected and will start focusing on what will help the people that we serve. And that would be uh, focusing on these jobs, giving people the opportunity, creating real value by making things in this country. Not only will we make the products, then we will give a chance to the American people to make it in America, and America will make it again. Uh, thank you very much for laying out the thematics and, and as well as the past history. Our theme in the Democratic Caucus here in the House is one of making it in America. Once again, going into Target, going down to the local automobile dealership and finding products that are made in America. The great strength of America historically for the last 150 years has been its manufacturing strength. But we need to understand that in the last decade we have seen the hollowing out of the American manufacturing industry. Uh, in, in, two, in 1999 there were 17,383,000 Americans working in manufacturing. In the decade that followed, more than six million of those jobs were lost. We saw the hollowing out of American manufacturing. That's the strength. It also happens to be the middle class. So our theme is make it in America. And as you say, if America is going to make it, we must once again make it in America. Manufacturing matters. Let me put up here on the board why it matters to the American public. What's happened in the last decade has been a skewing of the economy, the great unshared prosperity of America. We look at the bottom fifth of the population. These are the poor. They've seen a $200 annual increase in their well-being. The next fifth, 20 to 40 percent, they've seen a, just under a $10,000. And as you go up, you look at the top 10 percent, $300,000. You look at the top 1 percent of Americans. What's happened with them? Their wealth has grown by over nearly, by over 5,978,000. $1,870. So what's happened as a result of the policies of the Bush administration is a push to the wealthy and the clampdown of the working class in America. The middle class in America is losing the race to wealth, losing it to the top 1%. Let me put this another way. 
perhaps some people you might recognize. At the bottom, the poorest fifth, the folks that work for Walmart, 11% of the wealth went to them. The second poorest, these are the, t the uh, teachers, the same thing, very little, very little growth in their income. And as you get to the millionaires and billionaires, the Donald Trumps of the world, they have seen a 256%, a 256% increase in their wealth. At the bottom, an 11%. For the teachers, 18, 20%. For uh, uh, manufacturing, maybe a 32%. And here's where the money is. Here's where the money is. It's the super wealthy. They have seen a 256%. And if you take a close look, America, Take a close look at what was proposed yesterday by the Republican caucus. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, the Republican caucus proposed to take this skewing of wealth, the unshared prosperity, and push even more of it to the super wealthy of America. It is unconscionable, but that's what they propose to do, and they're going to do it with tax breaks for the wealthy, continuing on indefinitely, increasing the deficit by a trillion dollars. A trillion dollar increase because they want even more wealth to go to the super wealthy. At the same time, they're cutting the benefits that the working men and women rely upon. What are those benefits? Well, how about employment opportunities? How about educational opportunities? All of those are cut. And taking money out of the economy so that 700,000 men and women would lose their job this year in the next nine months. That's the Republican agenda. And for those who are not working, the seniors, the seniors of America, the Republicans are proposing to end Medicare as we know it, the privatization of Medicare, giving every senior in this nation an $11,000 voucher so that they can then go and negotiate with the rapacious greed of the health insurance companies. If you want to live to be 65 and finally have a health insurance policy that you can count on, Don't look to the Republicans, because they intend to terminate Medicare as we know it and turn over the well-being, the health, and indeed the life of every senior to the vagaries, to the rapacious profit orientation of the health insurance industry. That's what's going to happen if the Republicans get their way. We'll do everything we can to stop it. And we will also do everything we can to build the American middle class. Well, the gentleman yield. I would be delighted to. In addition to that, is